All right, be honest now. Before last week, had you even heard of a free trade deal between Canada and the European Union? The negotiations weren't a secret, but they certainly hadn't grabbed much attention. That's changed, and a lot of people are now asking questions. Sounds like a perfect time for a bottom line. Patty Croft is a former senior bank executive. Jim Stanford is an economist with Unifor. Preet Banerjee is a financial writer and broadcaster. And Amanda Lang is our senior business correspondent. Their thoughts in a moment, but first, this brief background. Well, if you buy into the spin lines coming from the government's newest cabinet minister, a beautiful new world is about to dawn. This is jobs, this is hope, this is opportunity. Who knew? Certainly not most Canadians. Not like 25 years ago when the first free trade deal, the one with the United States, bitterly divided the country and helped decide an election outcome. I happen to believe that you've sold us out. You do not have, you do not have a monopoly what? on patriotism. But this isn't 1988, and it's a far different world we live in. One where free trade deals between countries and regions now crisscross the globe. It is not just a good deal, it is an excellent deal. It involves Canada and 28 European nations with half a billion potential customers. Advocates say it could mean as many as 80,000 new Canadian jobs. It should be good for the beef and pork industries. We welcome this. It's a good news story for us. Perhaps not so good, for example, for dairy producers. But will they give up without a fight if Ottawa offers compensation? The dairy business is politically powerful and has shown muscle before when it felt government had sold it out. So what's really at stake this time? What could it mean for jobs, to consumers, to the overall economy? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? All important questions. Time for some answers. All right, so we heard the Prime Minister. This isn't just a good deal, it's an excellent deal. What do you think, Penny? I'm going to go one further. This is absolutely fabulous because, Peter, Canada is a trading nation. One third of economic activity is related to exports and one out of five jobs is directly linked to trade. This gives us access to a market of 500, 500 million people, rather. And it's not just about goods. That's the difference from NAFTA. It's about services. It's about government procurement and foreign direct investment. So I think this is a great deal. Absolutely fabulous. Sure. <laughs> Well, he said it's not a good deal, it's an excellent deal. The truth is, it isn't even a deal. That's the funny thing. We don't have a trade deal. They signed a piece of paper there the other day. I, I think they called it an opportunity. Uh, there was some kind of PR term for what they were signing. They don't have a deal. It will take uh, months, if not more, to work out the final dozens of issues that they haven't even signed Could be yet. up to two years. Could be up to two years. But and then if it's as mentioned... If it's as mentioned, I think the net impact for Canada will be negative. And uh, I also think that its importance has been overblown. Yes, there are 500 million people who live in Europe. That's more than live in North America. But our trade flows with the United States were of an order of magnitude larger. That NAFTA was 10 times more important to our economy than this deal was. Preet, where are you? It's probably a good deal, but I think you have to reserve judgment because we haven't seen the full text and it's a massive document. I think in the short term, if people are expecting this is going to fix all the economic problems of Canada or the EU, this is 10 years before you really see any implications. So it's probably a good deal, but can't tell until you see the document. Amanda. I mean, we can quibble over good deal, excellent deal, no deal yet. Mm -hmm. It's essential. Uh, Ms. Patty says, this is what we do, it's all we do, and while we are still very reliant on our neighbour to the south, that in fact may be to our detriment, because we've become slow and lazy, there's a big world out there, and if this gets our companies alert and awake to the possibility of that market, it's fantastic. We cannot afford not to be doing this kind of thing. Jesus. Kind of looks like we got like boys against girls here tonight. <laughs> Let's break it down a little bit. We've got, uh, you know, we have a relationship already with with Europe on on trade. What do we need to know as we discuss this about that relationship? What is our relationship with Europe, Tim? Well, our starting point in trade is kind of unbalanced uh, by two dimensions. First of all, the Europeans sell a lot more in Canada then we sell back the other way. Uh, this year they'll sell about $50 billion, uh, the imports that we buy, they'll buy about $30 billion back from us. So we're starting behind. Then there's a difference in the makeup of that trade. Most of what we sell to the Europeans, not surprisingly, is resources. Uh, some, a lot of minerals, some forest products, some agricultural goods. Most of what we buy back, pretty sophisticated, high-value merchandise, uh, manufactured products. 
and so on. So for, for those two reasons, I think our starting point is going to undermine the potential benefit of this deal to Canada. But I think right. that's where the potential is as, as well, Jim, because the fact of the matter is we are selling them resources. But this deal is not about resources. This deal is about technology. It's about services. We sell them $14.5 billion of services today, and the potential for that to increase by a factor of 10 or 20, I think, is huge. But it comes the other way, too, because we have a deficit on the services side as well as on the merchandise. For now. The thing For about now. the deficit is, which is used as people who don't like the deal, uh, however few there may be in Canada, uh, <laughs> as a reason not to do it. The thing is, if we have a deficit because we love French wine so much, it just got cheaper. Right? So it's good for consumers here if the stuff we're already buying is going to drop in price. And it's good for our businesses if the equipment we're bringing in, all that high-tech equipment, costs them less. And if it galvanizes them to say, hey, we better start competing because these guys make good stuff. Let's not just buy it. Let's make some of our own. All this talk about cheese and wine. <laughs> getting hungry. Pretty, we know about the kind of trade part of this deal. Mm -hmm. What else should we know about this deal? I think a big one is drug costs. So one of the provisions in CETA is patent protection. So right now... And CETA is the technical name right. for the deal, like NAFTA was the other one. Yeah. Right. So um, there's a 20-year protection on patents for drug companies right now. So that means that certain drugs, uh, companies have protection for 20 years with which to recoup their expenses for research and development and earn what is now turning out to be a very healthy profit. That could be extended by two more years. Now, the effect that has on uh, Canadians is that as proportionally our population gets older, drug companies costs go up. And of course, we've heard there's some concession there that the government might say, well, we'll offset that with some transfers from the government to the provinces, which essentially means that taxpayers will be subsidizing European drug makers for a small period of time. Now, it's 10 years before we see this, but this is somewhat concerning. Although this, this gets kind of lost in the shuffle. This just brings us up to international standards. And I had the CEO of a global drug company tell me that they thought until recently of Canada on par with China when it came to patent patent laws. So we do have some ground to cover to bring us up to par with the rest of the world. And my Jim. understanding, sorry, is it only applies to drugs that after after the deal is ratified. So it's not grandfathered to the existing ones. It's only going forward. All right. But by the government's own estimates, every additional year of patent protection is going to cost consumers about $750 million. So if indeed they're extended by two years and we don't know the detail yet, that's about $1.5 billion a year forever. And there's other ways in which the deal will also strengthen kind of the corporate position, if you like, uh, in our society. Uh, for example, European companies will now have the right to bid on provincial and municipal contracts uh, of all sorts. It's the first time we've ever opened up that area uh, of, uh, of business to a trade agreement. Plus, they will have the right to sue Canadian governments, now including provincial and municipal governments, in these special courts that they have set up for corporations. We've had some very negative experiences in Canada with those courts in the past. All right. I want to talk jobs, because I think for everybody, no matter where they sit on this, they look at jobs as, uh, as one of the key uh, issues surrounding any new deal. The, the number that's being tossed around is 80,000 potential new jobs in Canada. How, how real is that number? That's a big number, and I think to the point that's been made, we haven't seen the details of the deal yet, so I'm not sure where they get that number. But in theory, it could increase bilateral trade between the two areas by 20%. That'll add about $12 billion to the economy, and that's equivalent to 80,000 jobs. And Ontario has already come out and said 30,000 jobs in that province alone. But again, these are numbers. Uh, they seem to be pulled out of thin air, but I think what when we look at this 20 years from now, there will be a huge net benefit to jobs. I'm just not sure what the number is. Are you buying the math on the not really. The model that they used to come up with that 80,000 was based on GDP gains due to productivity, not job gains. So it's, it's interesting to see where they got that number from. I think maybe another aspect to look at is what happens to incomes. If products are cheaper, then domestic producers have to lower prices. And if that means lower sales, then that means less money with which to pay their workforce. So maybe this continuing trend of income stagnation is something that we'll see. Jim? I've looked at the numbers on a sort of sector by sector basis. We have some offensive sectors, if you like, that are going to gain under the deal. We have some defensive sectors. You have to weigh the balance. And in my calculations, I think we're looking at a net loss, probably between 30 and 150,000 jobs net loss over several years. It's not going to happen overnight, mostly in the manufacturing sector. Boy, that's quite a gap. There's a <laughs> yeah. quarter of a million here between the, the pros and the antis. But, Jim, the why job is crazy. the Canadian Manufacturing and Export Association all over this and saying that 80,000 is too low? That's the part I don't yeah. understand. But I, it's not just autos and manufacturing. It's chemicals, plastics, beef, pork. It's well, a very broad base. they represent global based. companies, remember, some of whom see an offensive interest from the European side mm -hmm. exporting into Canada. So in terms of the Canadian benefit, we as Canadians have to take our own judgment on it. We do know that 
uh, this is very organic, so any projections are tough, you know, till you yeah. see it in action. We also know, though, that all of the doom and gloom around the free trade agreement actually positioned us to open up trade with our big trading partner just as their economy was taking off. So what we, we may actually find exactly the same thing, that we, we have businesses and services that are accessing a market that's coming out of a bottom, and it will have the same effect. The, all of the worries about job loss after FTA, of course, did not materialize. Our economy benefited massively from mm. that. Some jobs were lost, but overall, still, still our, some the economy debate benefited on that part. massively. <laughs> Tell me uh, one thing that we haven't uh, considered yet about this deal, or we haven't thought about, or you haven't seen talked about. Pre well, I think maybe perhaps the timing of the negative consequences versus the positive. So with $700 million in tariff income per year, you know, that will disappear relatively quickly. For manufacturers, the ones that are affected, because some, some will be positively affected, if you have a plant closing, that's going to affect, you know, potentially a small community. That's, that's a real impact to a lot of people. So that's one thing that we have to consider, whereas the positive consequences could take time before you really see them materialize. Fanny? I guess one thing for me is uh, chicken and eggs. Uh, the eggs and, and poultry uh, industry have been very quiet because they were not included in this deal. There was rumors that that may have been affected, but supply management is alive and well in Canada. And yes, the cheese producers are unhappy, but the amount of imported cheese is still going to be less than 10%. They still control 90% of the market, and Canadians are still paying too much for dairy, eggs, and cheese. Amanda. I think one thing that we will actually will discover very quickly when, for businesses thinking this is very exciting and we're going to we're going to get over there is it's actually very complex because the Europeans have some of the most complicated rules about things regulations uh, and in many ways much more stringent than ours so we run, we run into this with the US the whole country of origin labeling on beef just wait until we try to get hormones into the European market and the you know the toxins levels in toys and there's I've already started talking to people who help businesses get there it's not a slam dunk to say I'm going to take my product to Europe, there's actually a lot of hurdles they may have to get over. Jim? I think we haven't addressed the macroeconomic side of it. We've talked a lot about tariffs and regulations. What about the general purchasing power on each side of the Atlantic? And that, again, I think is where Canada is going to uh, miss some of the benefits. The European economy, of course, has been through a crisis. They've cut back on public spending. Their overall purchasing power is very limited and is going to be limited for years to come. That means their, their spending power, if you like, to buy stuff from Canada is going to be very limited. That will limit the benefits. Uh, you know, US. you're the car guy here. Yes. And, and obviously, it's going to make some European cars, which a lot of Canadians favor. Higher end stuff that comes in, yeah. Will come in cheaper. Yes. But the opportunity exists for Canadian cars to sell in Europe. Yes. Now, is that a realistic opportunity? I don't think there will be much upside for the Canadian uh, industry. They have in introduced a, a, a special exemption where Canadian cars will be able to be sold in Europe, even if they don't meet the 50% uh, value-added rule that would be there. But that is going to be mostly a hypothetical thing. The reality is that the vehicles that are produced in Canadian plants are largely aimed at North American consumers. Whereas the Mercedes, BMWs, Audis, they are aimed at a global consumer. So there's a very one-way flow on the auto side. But as here well. again, the CEOs of GM and Ford have approved the deal. Yeah. They're behind the deal because what I've read, and you're the expert, what I've read is that car sales to Europe could increase by a factor of 10 to 12 no, times. No, there's a hypothetical to what we're selling ceiling now. there. But nobody thinks we're going to get anywhere near the ceiling. If, there, if we're selling 10,000 vehicles in Europe, let alone 100,000, uh, I'd be surprised. And remember, the CEO of Ford is CEO of a global company. Mm -hmm. Ford makes stuff in Europe that they want to sell in Canada after the deal, so they are happy with it. Okay, we only got a minute left before we want to take a break. Where are we going to notice a real difference, a real change, if this deal goes through? I think we will, if history bears out, see prices move. First of all, the stuff you buy from Europe that is here will get cheap. Maybe your Mercedes is only 6% cheaper, but you'll notice it. Uh, same with wine and cheese and a bunch of other products. The longer term stuff is, as Preet says, is going to be more subtle. What kind of jobs, what kind of industries, but we should see price action fairly soon. All right, we're going to take that quick break. But when we come back, you'll want to know this, this question. What will this deal really mean for you, the consumer? All right, welcome back to The Bottom Line. Patty, Jim, Preet, and Amanda are all at the table tonight. So what does it really mean for our viewers, consumers. Patty. I think it means jobs. I think it means opportunities for small, medium, and large businesses in Canada. And ultimately, it means lower prices for anything we consume, goods or services that come from the European Union. That's 28 countries. So nothing that's been said here tonight has changed your absolutely, <laughs> absolutely fabulous. <not. laughs> I'm the optimist. Jim. 
Uh, well, uh, obviously, first of all, to be a good consumer, you have to have a job. You have to have money to spend. So I agree that the job's impact is going to dominate whether this is beneficial for Canada or not. If Patty is right and it does unleash all tens of thousands of new jobs, then it will be beneficial. My look at the numbers thinks the opposite is going to occur. Uh, in terms of consumer prices, there's no guarantee they will fall in general. And the drug price effect is crucial here. The size of potential increases in drug prices would overwhelm the complete elimination of all the tariffs that we charge on European imports. So, yes, wine will be cheaper, cheese will be cheaper, your Mercedes-Benz will be cheaper. But drug prices, which everyone has to pay for, could more than offset that effect. And the drug price issue could really become a story yes. in this. Pre I think what you'll see is some sectors get more competitive, some become less competitive. So you might see some people shifting, uh, you know, uh, what we're good at, we're going to do more of that and same with Europe. But I mean, really what Patty said and, and uh, you know, lower prices, more jobs, net benefit long term. Yes. Short term, I think you'll see more negative um, aspects that will be brought to light. And some people might get their picture painted by that. Amanda. I almost think, I mean, all of those things, prices, jobs, there'll be ups and downs. I almost think the best thing about this is uh, how revealing this has been about our mindset on trade. You, you pointed out, you go back just 20 years and it was, you know, tearing the country mm. apart. Now, I don't know where Maud Barlow is. I wish her well. But th nobody's upset about this because most people sort of get we've got to live in a global world. And to me, that means we're on track with a Trans-Pacific Partnership trade agreement. We're on track for Japan. There's a bunch of other stuff coming our way. It changes the way our businesses think. Here's, and our kids will think. You know, they can go the and irony. live and work anywhere. We all agree as, as the economic commentators that trade is essential to Canada's economy. The irony is our trade performance has deteriorated. We actually export less since we signed the NAFTA than we did when we had NAFTA. But that's so why if your goal is, is so trade, important. if your goal is trade, a free trade agreement might not be the way to get there. Well, I that's, think that's based the deeper on question we our have Our largest to trading partner being the U.S. So Partly I think that, but it's, it's also important to diversify. Clear, we don't, we don't, we don't export less in absolute terms. We don't export less in absolute terms. as a share of our economy, we we're less to trade than dependent we export. Today. And as a share True. of our economy, our exports are smaller today than they were but when we signed But that's why our that. businesses need a shot in the arm exactly. or a kick in the I agree. you know what, and this kind of, of thing helps. I agree, and I'm not sure that a free trade agreement, per se, will do that. Now you know what O'Leary feels like. There you go. <laughs> okay. um, and you'll be getting an email from Maud Barlow. We can almost yeah. be assured of that. Uh, we've got a minute left. What to look for as we look ahead? I mean, if there's one thing we've learned from, you know, past deals, uh, whether they're trade or otherwise, Meech Lake is a great example. When you've got a long run time uh, to authorize that deal, things can go wrong yep. very fast, especially when you've got a whole bunch of different governments, which could change in the nature of those governments over a couple of years. Things can, uh, things can happen. What do you look for? To quickly? me, that's the wild card. I mean, we are kind of all sort of blithely saying as though this is a deal. Uh, various laws at every level of our of our federation have to be changed to accommodate the terms of the deal that haven't been inked. And so, uh, as you say, provincial governments can change, municipal governments can be involved. Uh, it's hard not to see some politics around some of this rearing its head at some point. You get the last word, Penny. 95% chance that it's done, but watch the EU. 28 separate countries have to approve it as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's a big 5%. It is. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all, and thank you as well. As always, we'd like to hear your thoughts on all this, so don't be shy. You can always reach us at cbcnews.ca slash the national.